Welcome to the Universe Inside Our Mind. I'm Dr. David Jubb. We have an incredible show for you today. It's all about love and uh, relationship. You know, uh, it's so amazing, you know, because we really live in a world and uh, that could be some of the major sorts of things that's sort of going on, isn't it? But it really is a lot to do. This topic is really a lot to do with sort of how we keep ourselves company. It's so amazing, isn't it? It is how we keep our self company and then what do we do within ourselves as the things going on in the world. Um, as we have interpreted things in a manner that we have an inner calm, um, you know, things are good. And then, uh, you know, something's gone on that's caused us to uh, interpret things more with an inner calm. But um, can you give love? If somebody's sort of really throwing a tantrum or something, can you give love? Can you, you know, I mean, can you continuously give love? I mean, um, is that person, can they receive it? When somebody's in a, throwing a tantrum, and you, can you change that? Yes. I think a lot of us might say yes, but the fact is no. Because when we act on another, we have other than allowed them to resolve something within themselves. You know, it's a bit, I mean, uh, we, we really are probably saying the same thing, you know, if we can really hear what this is about. Um, so, um, if, if um, someone, if I other than feel love within myself, can someone do something over there and they can act on me and then I will feel better? But won't I feel not quite right if that's going on? That's not sort of empowering, is it? No. But what about um, somebody sort of mad because they're always giving love, giving love, and it's just, but I just don't want to receive it. I can't, but, and, the, and the people could be mad because I'm not receiving it. But I can't receive it either. You see? Um, one feels love within themselves. But we can't get, get, get it from somebody else and, and um, somebody can't give, I can't give the person something to give and, and so the person feels love. As one is loving within themselves, this is love. As another is loving within themselves, this is love. If one is not loving within themselves, that's not love. Um, but there's all sorts of things that sort of mixed up with that word, isn't it? Because sort of if there's some need that's being met, there could be some dependence and some need is being met. But um, is love some need? The child doesn't have any need and the parents shouldn't have a need. There should be no need that's occurring in the relationship, you know. Um, isn't a lot of love just sort of in this world sort of to do more with the confusion of things that's to do with wanting and it's sort of lust, form of wanting, hmm? And having some need met and having a slave or something to um, satisfy that, you know. Hmm? Um, the child really, uh, when the child is looked at, you know, by the priest, the child, uh, the priest will tell you this child is spiritual. There is no priest that will step forward and say the child is not spiritual. Um, um, and my, no priest would step forward and say this child has to go to church to be spiritual. Um, all of the spiritual ministers and people will tell you that yes, here's this, but that's not this. It's a path to get somewhere, but it's not this. It's a path, but it's not this. Um, is it possible for us to actually love another person? That's the question. I mean, is there another? No, there isn't. There is only self and I and you. And as you and I and self are one, there is not another. And to be another, there has to be 
some idea that perhaps somebody could be loving over there but they might not be loving within themselves and how could that be so? And how could you do the loving for a tree? You're feeling something but what, I mean, something is transpiring there but it's sort of weak in comparison to what's going on within this organism itself. What would we think in ourselves that we have the power to influence everything around us in a manner that we're the ones that's going to make somebody happy, you're the one that's going to do this, but <clears throat> isn't that the trap that sort of causes you to feel as if you're burdened that something has to be done and as a result pain and suffering for, happens you know, because you're thinking that you, something would change on the outside that you wish and it's not and so that makes you upset, it makes you angry relationship and love is how we keep ourselves company how one keeps himself company is the very beingness of relationship how I keep self company is the very being and the essence of relationship if it's not possible for one to understand and do the understanding for another person is it possible to do the understanding for another person? no we cannot do the understanding for another person. Can we do the understanding for ourselves? Yes. We can do the understanding for ourselves. Um, and that's sort of um, limited. You know, but we can know something about ourselves. But do most people know something about themselves? Do they know themselves? People probably don't know themselves. But how could, if they know themselves as possible, then they might be able to have a greater sense of a universality, right? But otherwise, um, it's, we've come to a conclusion first that it's not really possible for someone to the, do the understanding for another person. I can't understand another person. I can understand myself, but most people really don't. I can love myself, but I can't really be doing the loving for another person. And I can't be loving another, another. As you are loving of yourself, you are loving. You know, there is no such thing as one other than being loving within and thinking they could do the loving over there. It's not possible. Um, as we more are sufficient, um, is the child not sufficient? Yes, she or he should be. You know, things love is self-sufficiency. As the child grows up more in an environment of self-sufficiency, as we connect with each other more on a level of self-sufficiency, as we can do this, we more, and even though you have a need, you're not connecting with the person on terms of that. You are connecting, we always do, on the connection that we have with each other of our universality. And, and, and from this then other things can occur but without this level of our connection how could we have some other connection? We only can have a great connection for everything else as a result of having uh, root, being rooted in this realization of how we keep ourselves company. How do we keep ourselves company? Um, um, ha um, how do you open a door in your house or close a drawer or um, how do you look at yourself in the mirror um, how do you sit down at the table to do or the desk to do work um, um, what feeling do you have when you um, see the tools that are to do with the trade of what you do and your feeling about this you see um, all sets the pace and everything that's going on within is the most powerful um, and would it be a um, waste of time if I had a focus of all of the things on the outside of myself but I hadn't really focused inside? What would be the reason for which is the most common conversation that's had is for people to have conversation about all the stuff that's happening on the outside but and everybody runs with that, but they haven't had a conversation about what's going on inside the person, themselves. It's sort of a bit of a distraction. 
I think most people actually really have, a, 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 they're in a cage and they have great bars, you know, and it takes some skill to rattle those bars. Anyway, when we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit more about this. This is Dr. David Job. This is the universe inside our mind. Stay tuned for some more exciting information coming up. Okay, we're back. It's so amazing, you know, um, because if we would be able to have more of a focus of the things that was going on within ourselves, it's possible for us to resolve many things because many times over, can it have been when you think back to what you did your own self, it was about your own belligerence, one's own uh, having been in judgment perhaps in the contribution of things where if we can just do what we can to keep a focus of things within ourselves in our own meditative state. Um, everything sort of uh, is like you, you being a light and moths around this. Um, the light really um, is uh, this which is within you that is this emptiness more of ourself as we can be. Um, and self-realization is more as we're, we're sufficient and love is a self-sufficiency. Love is sufficient. Love is sufficient. Sufficiency. Um, where there is not sufficiency, um, there's not love. As love, love is self-sufficiency. Um, when we uh, uh, connect, do we connect in a manner that empowers um, the people around us or other? Um, if you would have complained, if I would have complained, then that's a form of doing what I could have to have stolen other people's energy. Complaining is stealing other people's energy. Um, and so that's so very important that we could put things in terms of what it is that's a request about things rather than a complaint or a demand. I wonder if it's possible that we could rather than we must or we can't or you won't or don't. It's better to put things in terms of it's possible that this can be this way. Um, it's more sweeter than putting things in terms of demands and things. But it's, um, what language we have with each other is uh, just a reflection of the very language that we have with ourselves in our own inner dialogue. The more positive the language is and outcome orientated and um, solution orientated, a resource orientated, um, more positive framed, inclusive, the more that it involves this within your dialogue with others, the more it, it is a reflection of one's own inner dialogue. The more the dialogue is of course can have been about something else, that is really to do with how this person's keeping themselves company. And in relationship this is really what it is. There is no such thing as another. When we start to go into thought of another, we immediately are not focused of the very things that's within until such a f there is an emptiness. And as there is an emptiness, you've found this, and then it's possible to lend this emptiness to everything that is. But if I have a teepee, um, and I have the poles, and I, um, the usefulness of the teepee is where the the, the, uh, the poles for the TP are not. Where the pole is, there is no usefulness. But where the space is that the TP um, sets up is something where usefulness could be. But if I have a TP, do I have usefulness? No. I can only have usefulness come in to this vessel, but it has to be empty. Just the same as if you have a page and you go to write something down, we always search for a blank piece more to write on. We really less than care to all of a sudden write over something that's already there. And even painters care to sort of paint something, uh, you know, and then paint something on top of that and paint over, uh, put a new scene over another scene. It's better to start with a blank uh, scene and then you. Uh, canvas and you put something over that. 
Um, we all do this, but that's the kind of thing that actually we should really be doing in relationship with ourselves. We have to do what we can to be empty. And love is more uh, a vacuum where things just, you know, they fall in. You see, that's the best description of love. Love is more sort of a place where there is no walls. It's not a place, it's sort of a state of being. But it's a state of being where there's no walls. Um, it's a state of being where there's a self-sufficiency. And this is not something you can give somebody. You can't give it and then the person will feel. No. This, if you're doing that, it's like, gee, well that's pretty limiting. You have to give something and then the person feels. It's like, wow, why are you not feeling what is normal and natural? There could be some reason, but for the most of us, there should really be no reason, honest to God. There must be eons and eons of time that's spent um, that is really your natural state, which is this beautiful, meditative, harmonious, quiet, in a smile state. And coming from emptiness, not coming from anything. And, and, and to maintain this state, nothing is required. One doesn't have to turn themselves on with any thinking, and certainly one in their state is not turning themselves off with any thinking. So the mind's not being turned on or off with thinking at all. And um, in this world where we sort of see the paradigm of him and her, though there's all kinds of relationships, but there's a primary fantasy that's fed him and primary fantasy that's fed her. Her fantasy is a rich prince and his fantasy is a genetic celebrity. And the degree to which this is sort of something, it's like, what is that? But um, people might not be happy with those things alone at all. And when we cast our eggs into any one thing by itself, that's not love because it's just come from something which is really not about self-sufficiency. It was sort of more a, ro a, 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 a role that was being played, not a soul. <clears throat> But a soul really is more, a ho more whole, you know, <coughs> and well. And this circle and this well is only useful where the earth has been dug out. <coughs> and where the earth has been dug out, all earthen, thi what is useful can flow in. Um, but this well is only a well when all the earthen uh, lusting material things are empty and this then is well. Uh, well is for without anything physical in the well can then be the, the state of being for the well for what's useful to flow in. So as we are more empty we're able to be more creative and and we live a longer life and possums that are, um, don't have any predators they live twice as long as possums do that have predators. Um, the stress of living under the circumstance of predator um, can cause someone to only have half the life by itself and studies show this. So um, trapped blood proteins uh, can have gone between the cells of our body because of energy and motion and our energy and motion, emotion is the very first sort of language that we have you know between um, us as children and parents and, um, and as between parents there is an energy and motion but we might not have a language that we can discern up to that point but at some point there we do but we do have a language called an energy and motion and this is a primitive form of language and on this level, we can feel uh, uh, energy. We can feel how easy it is for our parents to make decisions, how easy it is and how calm, um, what level and degree of calmness that exists, um, and what, how secure and confident you are as a person can be very much to do with how confident and secure uh, mum and dad were. Um, certainly uh, we could say that wherever we see 
excellence, we could see, we could say that there was excellence modelled, you know, um, wherever excellence is, for the most part, we could definitely see that excellence has been modelled somewhere, and that because, and could we say where excellence isn't, excellence hasn't been modelled, because where excellence is modelled, uh, there's more adopting of excellence. Um, where excellence has not been modelled, uh, there is no real adopting of that because it could be just a taking on of behaviour that was uh, parrot fashion learned. But um, there's all sorts of uh, uh, dysfunctional sorts of uh, condi conditions that people can have lived within. One can have lived within a family where there was uh, oppositional defiance. Oppositional defiance um, is just complete uh, oppositional being oppositional and just c for the sake of oppositionalness but where somebody was oppositional to you and they only resolve things by being oppositional to you it can of course you to take on the victor's behavior and in relationship uh, there can be just this coming out um, in the safe confines of someone who apparently loves you um, because they'll stick with you though you could um, say things to them that's in opposition to them. But this is called oppositional defiance. Um, there's displacement um, dysfunction. Displacement dysfunction is where uh, we as people, as children, we can have just sort of been relegated to the side in some way and we could have felt like we were put to the side and we've gone through our life all as thinking in terms of just sort of putting one's own self to the side rather than actually feeling the importance of your own self in your being. Um, we could have um, weak ego defense because um, there was sort of a, an ego that had to form that formed to protect or something and then weak ego defense which um, causes a person to do uh, all kinds of things in manner of controlling. So the first thing that people do in uh, lo in a relationship which is not love is to be aloof and not to talk to and not to connect with and to sort of like um, just say that you will leave or that you would um, take away things or something and this is the first form of control. This is the kind of thing that did happen to most everyone as children and that's the kind of thing that happens in relationship where persons are unaware they are acting in the things, but the very little things that we do where we are are the very things that display the kind of things that went on when we were younger. But the, but the primary mode of controlling is by being aloof or not talking or being distant um, and being dissociated. Um, and people control others this way and, and people control you this way. The other sort of method that was used on you as a child was to distract which a certain amount of this could be useful but when one has a mode of completely operating where there's just distraction that's not good and there could be some reason why you should not distract but there could be a reason why you might distract but distraction is a primary mode of control where um, something won't be talked about um, because if it is it always it will turn into something else and, it's, and then there's a limiting of what can be talked about because it always turns into something else and so that's a mode of controlling, it's called, contro called distracting and that happened as a child um, that could have happened to one's parents one's just sort of reenacting a trauma that occurred, it's called a trauma reenactment syndrome where we took on the victor's behaviour where we didn't want to be the victim and so we took on the victor's behaviour and without any thinking about it we just took on the victor's behaviour and we could be just continuously having done that which that's not, that's dysfunctional. What's functional is really sort of um, quiet, inner peace, um, not really bothering other people in the playground where we see a child continuously bothering another child continuously or bullying another child uh, we could say that something's gone on that's created the circumstance of this for this child. 
and then that child is actually bullying another child. Um, uh, but and this is the very thing that goes on. Um, but we're in a mode at the moment where the papers can just condemn uh, him, certainly, you know, um, but they condemn the person who really is not loved. Um, but the person who acted in a less than loving way, uh, they, they act in a less than loving way because they have been not loved um, and they're sort of stuck. And um, they were around people who were not loving people and they became ingrained with this and even this convention and society is really not loving at all. Um, we do what we can to make it this way um, but it, it, it's not really. Um, the idea of a family living just with a mother and a father and there being no village. We always grew up more with a village and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and grandparents and everybody all assisted to help raise us and we took part in our care and there was always a great freshness and a beauty in being. But in the nuclear family setting where there is these guarded gate, gated communities where you drive and nobody's on the footpath and um, it's, you don't see anybody and then you're sat in front of a TV, there really is no interaction. There's no community. The richness of the interaction that's engaged in even you reading a story and being read a story is so beautiful in comparison to just watching uh, some favorite TV program. Watching a favorite TV program, there is no interaction and studies show that after more than two hours a day, um, creativity for children later on in life is seriously hampered. But even um, parents who are get, buying DVDs for children that are apparently educational is still not, this, not interactive and taking time away from an interactiveness, you know. But um, we need to really do what we can to so be more self-realized and as we're self-realized we're uh, without a story. And we've developed a process of investigation through the use of this process of investigation we have cleared away our own story. And as we've cleared away our own story, this is love. But before this, it's not. This is Dr. David Job. This is the universe inside our mind. Stay tuned for some more exciting shows coming up.